This week's paper is titled The Longitudinal Effects of Resisted Sprint Training Using Weighted Sleds Versus Weighted Vests. And this is coming at us from, yep, University of Pennsylvania. So one university seems involved in this, which is, uh, which is good. So a lot of times we see like a kind of conglomeration of like two or three different universities, which is very interesting how it works often across different countries. So interesting how this was all done in one university, which is what you would think most studies would be done with. So the researchers, the purpose of this paper was Basically, the researchers wanted to see, was there any positive, negative, or null effects on weighted sprinting versus unweighted sprinting? So what they did was they got 20 NCAA Division Three lacrosse players and they divided them into three groups. So they had a sprint training group pulling a weighted sled. They had a sprint training group with a weighted vest. And then, of course, they had a control group, essentially. So a group in the exact same program with the same volume, but unweighted, so normal sprints. So the training protocol for this was they had 13 sprint sessions, uh, 60 minutes each, uh, twice a week over the course of seven weeks. Uh, they had a break near the end due to school holidays. During this, they also continued to do their three times a week strength conditioning program as provided by their strength conditioning coaches. Prior to the study, all the athletes had gone through a pre-season lacrosse uh, off-season phase. So they were all in uh, good trained condition. So they were relatively well adapted to their training so there was no kind of you know there was no skewing in this in terms of some of them being untrained some of them being trained so they'd all gone through the same six-week program before this so they kind of a nice homogenous kind of basis or as much as you can across athletes so what was measured was they had a pre and post sprint time obviously so the average velocity was recorded from 18.3 meters to 54.9 meters also recorded was stride length stride rate ground contact time and flight time of the running so the, for the pre and post testing what they did was three max sprints up to a length of 54.9 meters. So interesting, they wanted to kind of see what would be the best weighted value for the weighted sprinting and the weighted sleds. So for the weighted vest and the weighted sleds, I should say. So what other studies would kind of pick, they would say, we're going to try 45% of the, the participants' body mass, or we're going to try something like 75%, a little bit heavier, depending on what's, you know, what, what kind of their interpretation of the previous data had been and what they think might work. So in this group, they went to... They did five pilot tests with uh, some, I don't know if it was the same or they didn't specify if it was the same or different lacrosse players. But what they ended up was some from some pilot testing, they ended up with the most useful weight uh, for the weighted sled was 10% of the participants body mass. And for the weighted vest was 18.5% of the participants body mass. So next up is Fitzy Poodles with the results. So on to the results section next. The results from this study kind of echo a lot of previous studies and they echo kind of our own original opinions on this. We'll run through them quickly. For the both weighted sled and weighted vests uh, changes. So this is a change in time for the, the race and the average velocity over the course of the race. We get trivial changes uh, from pre to post. Then we get actual increases. So a small effect over the course of the six or eight weeks for the unresisted sprint group. So the unresisted sprint group get an effect size of about 0.61 or 0.62 for both time and for average velocity over the course of the run. When you compare this then with the weighted sled and weighted vest, you see effect sizes of like 0 0.02. I think for the weighted vest, you might have a highest effect size of 0.25, which would still be in the kind of Rhea model of effect sizes that would still be shown to be trivial or non-effect. An interesting note here on effect size. So the Rhea model for effect size is just a different model basically that's used. So when you look at effect sizes, you'll usually have between zero and one and you'll have different brackets. So it'll be like trivial effect or non-effect. You'll have small effect, medium effect, large effect. Just in different studies because the rates of change or the relative change over the course of a standard intervention will be quite different for say a speed intervention versus a cardiovascular fitness intervention the rea model is used specifically for conditioning for sprint times for jumps uh, so it just the model fits it a small bit better this is probably one of the only times you'll see us using that rea model i spoke earlier about saying this kind of mirrors or this echoes previous results and, and our own opinions. A study that comes to mind for this is the Zaviridis study in 2005. I'm probably after butchering that name, uh, but it's basically 22 recreationally trained males 
it's very very similar you have a control group or a normal training group so they're unresisted and then a weighted sled group what you see is like change in sprint dynamics uh where you get a increasing stride length shortening of or sorry increasing stride rate shortening of stride length in that study they showed increased efficacy during the acceleration phase but a decreasing in max velocity when you brought in resistance training and then the the kind of overall or overarching results very much uh echo what we see here it's important to note that there's other studies out there where they show resistance sprinting can be quite beneficial uh, a study such as this would be Kafer and adamson i think it was in 1994 that's like in 20 to 60 meter sprints uh they showed some improvement from weighted sled work it's very difficult to relay this across um when we look at sprinting dynamics when we look at uh very very kind of acute measures of sprint time just due to the fact that 1994 we had very different testing methods and testing techniques particularly when it comes to kinematics from what we use now so now we typically see something like a a slow motion camera with some 3d or we could have a 3d management system where you'd have actual point markers on people and you're getting very accurate representations of where they are in space as they're doing their sprint so if they're being uh, videoed from the side on you can actually do a very accurate 3d model of where each joint is the relation of one joint angle to the other in 1994 it would have been something quite different um it might have been what you'd consider to be now a normal tv monitor you'd be able to pick out the points so they might just have points taped on in a similar fashion to what we would use now and then a person would go through and manually tag on the screen with a reference grid over it and they record each of those manually what that means is the amount of data points we get are significantly different so our data is less precise we also have an issue here with uh muddying of water due to the fact that we have less data points so if you take for example that if i draw a curve here if I draw that same curve, but I have a thousand points, it will look something like this once I go to model it. If I have three points, it will look like a triangle. So this is where we kind of lose some of the, the nuances within the kinematics. Uh, so when we look at joint angle, when we look at ground contact time, when we look at stride length, that we can just get a muddying of the water. Uh, and it's not that I disregard these results from earlier studies, but they have to be taken with a pinch of salt. So. 2005 still isn't that recent um, when you look at kind of really rigorous scientific findings, but 2005 is still a lot more relative or a lot more important to our discussion today than a 1994 study will be. On to the discussion next. You know our opinions on this or people who would have listened to the podcast continuously for the last few years will know that we're not big fans of resisted shrink sprint training. Uh, I think it has applications in, in certain areas, in certain sporting realms where it can be quite beneficial and when we look at where these applications may lie we first have to look at the kind of alteration of mechanics when you go from a normal sprint to a resisted sprint so typically what you see here is you see an elongation of the time where our foot is in contact with the floor so usually in sprinting we'll have very very short ground contact times the foot is just barely hitting the ground it's imparting the maximum amount of horizontal force and then it's skiffing off again so it's a very short ground reaction time once we start people on resisted sprinting the ground reaction time gets longer this is obviously due to the fact that they're pushing against the resistance the mechanics of how they move tends to change right so if you take a side profile of how somebody would usually sprint when they're in a maximal like velocity phase they are fully upright their chest is out in front they're still leaning forward obviously because they're running but they are as upright as they're going to be at any phase during the race when we put somebody into a resisted sprint they will be much much more in an inclined position so this is a position similar to what you'd see in a acceleration phase or the first 30 meters of a 100 meter race the athlete is almost 45 degrees to the floor they are in this position so they can put the maximum amount of horizontal force in so they're constantly falling forward they're pushing that ground horizontally away from them and this is to build speed and impart the maximum amount of force onto the ground each time the use of a resisted sprint comes in when we want to spread out this acceleration phase so when i want to get someone to be able to lean in more to be able to impart more force on the ground and possibly have longer ground contact times 
There are a few cases which come to mind immediately in this. So an American football player who's going to be hitting somebody and driving them backwards. Uh, a rugby player who's going to be tackling somebody, driving them backwards. A bobsledder who's going to be pushing on that bobsled and sprinting in that inclined position. They're, these are all great drills for them. The other thing that you'll have in common with all three of these is that these are happening against resistance. So the sport itself is happening against resistance and I'm then being more specific to my sport by adding resistance onto me, whether that be with a sled, ideally in those cases, or there's other cases where a weighted vest would also be a fairly reasonable application of resistance. So then when we look at this and we look at this as a practical application, we have to start seeing like, okay, what kind of resistances are applicable here, right? So should I be really loading someone up so I'm altering their stride in a way where it no longer looks like a sprint? So this would be like uh, wearing a harness and walking with the equivalent of my body weight on a sled behind. I will basically just be doing a really slow walk. I'll be extending my feet really far behind me. I'll barely be able to move. And you see certain athletes doing this, like an example would be powerlifters doing some conditioning or crossfitters using it. Uh, but this is a slow walk. So when you look for a sprint and it's actually pointed to in this study, I think Owen might have actually mentioned it earlier, is that they say up to 10% of body weight can be used uh, and you need a noticeable drop in sprint times, right? So there's no point in me using a very, very light weight because I'm probably getting nothing from the resistance. There's also no point in me getting up to a weight that's high enough to change my sprinting style or sprinting stride or sprinting technique. The last point to note here is that on underweighted sprints, so if I have the application of a a sled athlete or a rugby player or American football player or a soccer player who's going to be running against the resistance when i look at weighting their sled the most important thing or one of the most important things i need to look at is that it's going to be uh, consistent resistance over the course of the sprint what happens with underweighted sleds are is they hop up and down because the weight of the sled itself doesn't overcome that uh, dynamic friction that's happening between the sled and the surface is sliding across and it will continue to hop up and down so that's usually why you would see something up around 10 percent of body weight it's still very very light but it should allow that sled to sit on the ground and provide a fairly consistent resistance over the course of my training bout so when it gets to the weighted sprints, it's kind of a funny topic because if you look at something like strength training, for example, you kind of are muscle building, whatever, you're kind of looking for that overcompensation phase from hard training. Um, so like if you, for example, you're squatting 100 kilos and, you know, 80 kilos feels incredibly heavy for reps. But if you improve your back squat to 200 kilos, 80 kilos for reps is suddenly a lot easier. You know, when you get to hypertrophy training, you're looking for a degradation of the muscle to induce an improvement in kind of simple terms so you're looking for the muscle to overcompensate for the work that you did in hopes in the future that it'll be able to kind of defend itself against that stimulus but something with weighted sprints you would kind of imagine that it would follow the same system so you do weighted sprints you're putting in more effort for these weighted sprints they're harder than normal weighted sprints you're not going as fast more often than not so then you would think in theory that you would then overcompensate and run faster you know and it's something that still prevails and i don't think there's any kind of logical fallacy to assume well if you look at it like this this is not actually what's happening the only reason it's become evident i think that weighted sprints don't particularly work is there's a plethora of evidence suggesting that they probably it seems very very likely that they don't work for improving your straight up sprint time on flat ground for some reason it so there's kind of the theory known in sports sciences and you've heard me if you've listened to podcasts or any youtubes you've heard me talk about it a lot but it, it keeps coming up with this kind of sports training kind of sprint training kind of power output training it's called the maximal dynamic hypothesis hypothesis output so basically what it says is that the lower limbs most effectively put out the most amount of power against your own body weight so just with your own body weight so when it comes to things like jumping and sprinting power and momentum movements your own body weight is when your body produces the most power. So it seems that it kind of makes sense, I suppose, when you think about it in one way, that your body is hyper-specific to you sprinting. So you're sprinting, evolutionary, I suppose, would have developed unweighted more often than not. So you want to be running as fast as possible, unweighted. And that seems to be the way these sprint training things go. So you are plyometric, so weighted jumps don't seem to make you better at your vertical jump. Weighted sprints very, very often, and it seems to follow that growing trend. You know, if you kind of bring in all the other evidence... And look at kind of randomized controlled studies like these that it does not improve your sprinting time uh you would be forgiven i think 
more often than not to assume that it would improve it given the other aspects of training that do improve when you kind of overload them or overstress the body um but i'd say in this regard it doesn't seem like if you want to get better at sprinting doesn't seem like weighted sprints is the way to go if anything it looks like just more sprinting will make you better so this is kind of again a broader topic then if you look at it from like sports hyper specificity so you want to be as specific as possible when you're doing your sport uh, this is kind of something we talked about as well when we were talking about Anthony Joshua's video, right? So we talked about the the very, very likely maladaptive process that happens when you're doing weighted punches. So weighted punches more than likely don't make your punches more powerful. Uh, the lower limbs and upper limbs seem to be kind of segregated in the sports science, but it seems very likely that the theory would be the same. So, you know, the those weighted punches probably weren't making him, his punches faster or more powerful. Um, so it's something to bear in mind. Not to say there's no uses for weighted sprints or weighted vest runs or anything like that, but in terms of if you have sprinters or people who need to sprint faster unweighted, you probably shouldn't be weighting their sprints. So if you like what we're about, uh, we do a lot of one-to-one coaching, fit six all our real athletes, so he's a lot of rugby players, jiu-jitsu players, um, we have plenty of programs, so if you're an athlete who's in the off-season now, we've got a couple of blocks of an off-season program where you just need to add some strength and hypertrophy. And because there's been a recent lot of interest, you know, we had stayed away from doing an actual combat sports program, or specifically an off-season combat sport program. But because there's been a lot of interest in it, and we can only take so many one-to-ones, so we're gonna. There's a little combat sports program in the mix. In the meantime, if you're a weightlifter, our new snatch programs came out last week. So we had three different streams of snatch programs. So we week overhead, fix your swing and pull, and just get a good old-fashioned PB. So three programs, eight weeks, two sessions a week. So head over to get those. And if you just like strength training, we have a host of strength, uh, squat, pull, press, and powerlifting programs on seekstrength.com. So check those out. And there's still currently a discount on the squat program. So WH10 will get you 10% off. And thanks for watching, guys.